Welcome to the 187th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Matthew Dix, author of the novels Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, Something Missing, and Unexpectedly Milo, and the upcoming The Perfect Comeback of Caroline Jacobs. His novels have been translated into more than 25 languages worldwide, and his most recent is an international bestseller. Stay tuned for my interview with Matthew Dix. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Matthew Dix, author of Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, Unexpectedly Milo, and Something Missing. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for Sure. Well, can you read a few pages from your novel, Memoirs of of an Imaginary Friend? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. So this is on. This is the very beginning. Here, my, I have been alive for five years. Five years is a very long time for someone like me to be alive. Max gave me my name. Max is the only human person who can see me. Max's parents call me an imaginary friend. I love Max's teacher, Mrs. Gosk. I do not like Max's other teacher, Mrs. Patterson. I am not imaginary. Uh, I am lucky as imaginary friends go. I've been alive a lot longer than most. I once knew an imaginary friend named Philippe. He was the imaginary friend of one of Max's classmates in preschool. He lasted less than a week. One day he popped into the world, looking pretty human except for his lack of ears. Lots of imaginary friends lack ears. And then a few days later, he was gone. I'm also lucky that Max has a great imagination. I once knew an imaginary friend named Chomp, who was just a spot on the wall. Just a fuzzy black blob without any real shape at all. Chomp could talk talk and sort of slide up and down the wall, but he was a two-dimensional piece of paper, so he could never pry himself off the wall. He didn't have arms and legs like me. He didn't even have a face. Imaginary friends get their appearance from their human friend's imagination. Max is a very creative boy, so I have two arms, two legs, and a face. I'm not missing a single body part, and that makes me a rarity in the world of imaginary friends. Most imaginary friends are missing something or other, or, and some don't even look human at all, like Chomp. I guess I'll stop right there. Great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Memoirs of of an Imaginary Friend yet, how would you describe the novel? Uh, Well, it's a novel told from the perspective of Budo, uh, who's an imaginary friend to Max. And um, it's a novel that presumes that imaginary friends are real. Uh, They're beings that we can't see as human beings ourselves. But once imagined and created, they operate independently from their imaginer. And uh, in memoirs, the character Budo, he's very aware to a greater degree than most imaginary friends because his friend Max is um, highly imaginative. He's uh, a kid who's on the autistic spectrum. And so Budo has been alive a very long time, but he's very aware that his time is probably coming to an end. And so a lot of the book deals with the idea of um, knowing that your end is coming and uh, what you will do to preserve your life as long as possible and um, what you'll do for a friend, um, even if that will cost you your life. So he, he's constantly going through um, that dilemma throughout the book. Gotcha. Well, do you remember if there was a specific moment when you had the idea for memoirs of, of an imaginary friend? Uh, yeah, I was, um, I'm a teacher as well. I teach fifth grade and I was on the playground one day with a student teacher and we saw a boy talking to a tree. It looked like he was talking to a tree at least. And she pointed and asked him, uh, she asked me what he was doing. And I said, maybe he has an imaginary friend. And we started talking about imaginary friends as we watched this boy talk to the tree. And when I was growing up, I had an imaginary friend. Um, His name was Johnson Johnson. And I explained to the student teacher that I didn't know my imaginary friend was imaginary until much later in life. My, My family, my stepfather had been a psychiatric social worker. So on a Friday, if a kid didn't have a placement, the kid would come home with my stepfather and would 
sort of be in our house and sleep on a mattress that we kept underneath my bed. We'd pull it out for that kid. And for the longest time, I had just assumed that Johnson Johnson was one of those kids who had stayed with us for a long time. And it wasn't until much later in life that my I happened to be talking about him. And my mother stopped me mid-sentence and said, you realize he was imaginary, right? And uh, it sort of rocked my world. So I told that story to my student teacher. And she thought it would be a great idea for a book. And I thought it was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. But I added it to my list. <laughs> and um, I eventually wrote it. And, and so do you keep a list of your, of your novel ideas? I do. Well, I have a, you know, the one thing I have going for me is I have a lot of ideas for books. So when it comes time to write a new one, I put the list together and I sort of summarize what I think the book would be. And then I send that list to my agent and to my wife. My wife is sitting across the table from me at the time and my agent's on the West Coast. And then they decide which book I'm going to write next and they tell me which one to write. <laughs> Great. Well, when I met you in Vermont at the first Booktopia event, you told a story about how you started writing your first novel, Something Missing. Can can you recount that story now? The Boca Raton story, probably? Yes, yes. So it was, um, I don't know what year, maybe 2005 or even earlier, maybe, yeah, probably about 2005. I went to school to write novels. Um, you know, I took creative writing and envisioning that I'd be a novelist someday, but it just didn't work out when I graduated. For years, I tried to write books, and none of them happened. I, I was excellent at buying Post-it notes, and I would plot my books out on Post-it notes and put them up on whiteboards, and I'd envision these fabulous books, and then nothing would happen on the page, and it, it, they would just be terrible, terrible attempts. So I kind of gave up on novels. I just didn't think it was going to happen for me. And then my wife took me to Boca Raton uh, for the first time to visit her Nana, who was 85 at the time, and now she's 92. But she was sort of 85 going on 55. She, you know, she had homes in three places in the country, and she was driving and dating and going to college classes. So she picked us up at the airport and brought us to her um, compound, this, this um, <laughs> large Boca Raton estate for older folks. And uh, she didn't have Wi-Fi, and she didn't have cable, and I wasn't aware of any of these things. And to get off the property, you sort of had to walk like two miles to a four-lane highway. And if you managed to cross the highway, you could go to Target. That was the extent of what I could do while I was there. And, you know, we'd go to breakfast at 7.30 in the morning at the club, and we'd talk about what we were going to have for lunch. And then at 11.30, we'd go back to the club for lunch, and we'd talk about where we're going to go out to dinner. <laughs> and then we'd go to dinner at 4.30 at some restaurant off the compound, and then we'd come home. And without Wi-Fi or a book, to, I, I brought one book, and I finished it in a couple of days. I was just bored. And so Nana went out. This is the beginning of my career right here. It was a Wednesday night. Nana went out. She had a date with a man named Joe who was in the ICU unit at the local hospital. And then she was going to an opera class afterwards. So I was stuck at Nana's house without cable or Wi-Fi or a book to read. And I had this idea for a, um, for a short story, what I thought it was going to be, a, a story about a guy who steals one earring from every woman's house so that no woman would ever suspect him of breaking in. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to write that short story about the guy who breaks into somebody's house and steals one earring. And that was the start of something missing. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had started a novel. And it was because I didn't have post-it notes and I didn't have the idea for the story already. I just had the idea for a character. I discovered that that's the way I write and that's the way I can be successful. And, and when did you figure out that it was a novel? You know, I just I kept writing for the first time and it really felt good for the first time. I, no one had ever told me that there are writers who write in the blind, that you don't know where your story is going and you just write. And, you know, it turns out about half the writers of the world write this way. Many novelists um, don't know what the next page holds until they write that page. There are some that know, you know, famously they know the last line in their book and they, they plot everything out. But lots of us don't. And I was one of those writers, but no one bothered to tell me that um, I had to discover it on my own. So I just started writing. And by the time I finished in Boca, I had what looked like three chapters. I had, you know, probably 20 novel length pages and I didn't have a plot at all. I was just sort of creating this job for this character and it just felt right. And I said, well, this is at least going to be a very long short story at this point and maybe it's going to be something more. 
I wasn't really sure for a, for a while. You know, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to sustain it. But once I found a plot, then I knew I was on my way. And and what was it like finishing that novel once you found the plot? Um, it was interesting because the way I write, I don't know how my novels are going to end until they end. So Martin is the thief and something missing. And at the end, basically, he has the options of like getting off with his crimes or going to jail or getting killed because he's sort of in this precarious situation with this real bad guy. And um, he's climbing some stairs at the end about to face off with the bad guy sort of. And it was a Saturday morning and my wife called me and I said, I have to go. I'm about to find out what happens to Martin. And she said, what happens? And I said, I don't know. I'm in the middle of the stairway. I won't know till I get to the top. So, you know, I know it sounds very strange for readers to hear, but the book unfolds for me just a few seconds before it unfolds for a reader. So um, I never know when the ending's coming in. I remember when I wrote the last line of that book, I knew it was the end because I didn't have anything else to say, or at least anything else to say that I knew it was. So it was like reading a book and writing a book at the same time for me. That's so it was this odd sense of I was, I felt great about actually finishing a novel and I never thought it would get published. I thought, great, I've finished a novel, but it was also just great to find out what was going to happen with Martin. And that's the way it's been for all my books since. So, so what do you think was the issue with your earlier attempts at, at fiction? Do you think that, that trying to plot everything out basically uh, kept you stuck as opposed to just coming at it in a more organic approach? Yeah, very much so. I, if I, you know, if one, the thing that I can do in writing is um, I, when I discover the character who I want to write about, that character sort of downloads into my brain instantly. I really can become a person in the novel. Now, I don't know where it, he, this person is really supposed to go and what's going to happen, but I, um, I know the characters in my novels very, very well. I just don't have any idea what path they're going to go on. And I used to be concerned about the path. I thought that was the most important thing. And ultimately, you have to have a plot or things aren't going to work out for you. But... Um, but it was that obsession I had with I have to know my beginning, middle, and end that I hear a lot of teachers, frankly, in um, elementary and high school teaching creative writing say, you know, plan out your story before you start writing it. And it works for some people. It just doesn't work for everyone. So once I let go of that, then I was able to write. Sure. And what was the publishing process like for you once you finished something missing? Well, I had an agent. That was the important part. And I honestly, I didn't think I was going to get one, but I took a I took a very serious approach to it. I had the summer because I'm a teacher. I had eight weeks and I decided I was going to make it my job for the eight weeks. So I worked 40 hours a week for all eight weeks. Uh, back then, nothing was done on the internet. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It was 2006 or seven, but everything was done through the mail still back then. And so I got a copy of the writer's market. I pulled out 200 agents who I thought would be interested in my book. I narrowed that down to 100 and then I started internet stalking those hundred agents to figure out who would most likely want my book. So my agent is Taryn Fagerness, and she at the time was working at a big agency with about eight or nine agents. So I, I did as much research on all of those agents at her agency to determine which agent was the most likely to enjoy my book. So I did that religiously and obsessively. Um, you know, I created databases and spreadsheets <laughs> and ultimately I ended up with a hundred agents who I could query. And from those, um, hundred, I, I did what they asked and sent everything out and I got lucky to get my agent. That's great. Well, in addition to writing novels, you, you're also a participant in storytelling events such as the moth. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you've organized some storytelling events yourself in Connecticut. Do you think verbally telling stories impacts your fiction writing or are they just two separate disciplines? For me, they're separate because my verbal stories are all personal stories. I tell stories about my own life and uh, it's very different than fiction, at least for me. Um, storytelling has a limit, sort of people can only listen to you for so long. Whereas a novel, I have a lot more room to sort of spread out and um, do whatever I want. And storytelling, the successful storytelling is the storytelling that reveals something about yourself that um, people might not have known 
or is surprising or may touch them in a way that it touched you. Whereas in a novel, although there's bits of me in every novel and some of them have more of me than others, um, there's large swaths of the novel that are entirely made up and there are characters that I really can't connect to personally. I can connect to as a, as the author and as a creative person, but, um, many, many characters are just not reflective of me in any way. So it's a, it's very different. Sure. And, and have you thought about, uh, writing essays based on your, on your, uh, storytelling, um, and, yeah. and possibly trying to, to publish those as, as more kind of memoir. Yeah, we're, we're actually in that you're, <laughs> You're, um, we're in that process right now. You're, you're good thinking. <laughs> <We're>, um, <laughs> we, I, sh- I will hopefully have news on that at some point soon. Yes. Okay. Uh, so are, are you working on another novel now? I am. I'm wrapping up my um, next novel, uh, Revisions, and I'm in the process of writing my next one as well, the, the one that will be after that one. Gotcha. And, and are you at a point where you could talk about the one that you are finishing up? Yeah. Um, the one I'm finishing up, the title is um, The Perfect Comeback of Caroline Jacobs. It's a story about a woman. Um, she's in her 40s when the book opens, and uh, she's not very happy with her life. She's dissatisfied with the place she is in the world. And um, some things happen that cause her to sort of reflect on her life. And she realizes that um, the direction that she's taken was sort of altered. The problem in her life happened when she was in high school. She was um, bullied in a real terrible way. She was sort of excluded. She lost her best friend and her best friend turned against her. And it was just a gentle nudge, but um, gentle nudges over long periods of time can result in, um, you know, large variations in terms of your, your course in life. And she sort of realizes that that was the first time she sort of went off course. And, so she decides that uh, she's going to go back to her hometown and find the girl who bullied her and say the things that she should have said um, when the bullying first happened. And so she brings her daughter, who she doesn't have a very good relationship with her, um, back to the hometown to find that girl and to try to sort of set things right as best she can from when she was a teenager. It's a book full of women, um, which you know my previous protagonists have all been men. So this is a book with... Um, Lots of ladies in the book, so it was a new challenge for me. And and how did you how did you handle that challenge? Well, I made sure that I, I, when I write, I um when I finish a chapter, I send it out to ten readers to um, give me feedback. I, I grew up on video games, and I like immediate feedback at all times. I have to know my <laughs> like I have to know what my score is at all times. So um, over the years, I've I've created a database of people who read my novels and give me feedback. And um, I usually use about 10, but I have about 30 people in the database and I pick and choose based upon the book and what skill sets they have. I've actually, I, I pull out their skills and they're listed in the database. They would hate if they knew any of this, <laughs> that I'm analyzing them this way. <laughs> but I made sure that most of my readers as I was going through were women so that they could um, help me with sort of, does this sound right? Is this what you might say? Things like that. I've also had the advantage of working as an elementary school teacher for 15 years. And before that, I went to an all-women's school for four years. So I've been in the company of women for about 20 years, like almost exclusively. So although I'm a man and I don't know much, um, I know a little bit more than the average man. I like like so much time with women. So a lot of the conversations and a lot of the situations that happen in the novel, I'm able to draw from my experiences with women. Gotcha. So I wanted to go back for a moment to talk about the storytelling. I was curious, do you, do you plot your, your storytelling beforehand or is it all extemporaneous? No, no I do. I mean, I, I perform in different ways. I, I work with the moth quite a bit and a lot of the moth performances are competitions. So they'll give me a theme that I have to choose a story from or choose a story that fits the theme. Um, but then my wife and I run a storytelling organization here in Connecticut there's also a theme, but it's not competitive. Generally, I, I try to find a story that's going to fit the theme they've requested. And with storytelling, the question I always ask myself is, um, what am I trying to say with the story that I'm about to tell? So um, I have a story where I talk about stealing some shoes when I was a kid. And it's one of those stories that's 
I've got a lot of hijinks. It's a, it's a very popular story that I tell because it's very funny. But if I just take the stage and I tell a funny story, it's essentially a dinner party story or a bar. It's a story you tell your buddies in the bar to really make it something that's going to mean something to people and we'll stick with them later. I have to ask myself, why am I really telling this story? I'm not really telling the story so people know I stole shoes. And ultimately, that story is a story about me being incredibly poor when I was 18 years old and kind of hungry and worried that I'm going to starve and freeze when I steal the shoes. And then when I'm 20, we actually return the shoes to the store. Um, and how in the course of two years, poverty can sort of embolden you and you can find a lot of strength through survival. So it ends up being a story about me learning that I have more strength and more um, survival instincts in me than I thought I did. But I tell it and I tell that story in an entertaining way by making people laugh about the ridiculousness of me stealing shoes from a children's shoe store. <laughs> Well, well, I know that, uh, you, as you've mentioned several times, you work as a fifth grade teacher, and I know you also have worked as a wedding DJ as well. Uh, I'm curious about your writing process. When do you usually write? Do you write in the mornings or the evenings? Or um, I, I like to tell people I write in the cracks of my life, <laughs> um, which does mean I write in the morning. I don't sleep very much, so I get up around four every morning, and I have a good couple hours before my kids wake up to work. And um, I write in the evenings um, a little bit when they go to bed, but I take advantage of every moment I have. So if my wife is giving our kids a bath and she doesn't need my help and I know I have 10 minutes, I'll sit down and say, let's see if I can write four good sentences in the next 10 minutes. So sometimes I'm writing in two minute spurts and sometimes this morning I wrote in a good three hour spurt. I, you know, I left the house and I went to McDonald's and, um, drank a lot of Diet Coke and, um, you know, banged out a bunch of pages. So sometimes it's in larger bits, but I hear a lot of writers talk about they need, like, they can only write in a place or they can only write on their certain computer or they, they can only write in the morning or they need three hours to write. And I just think that it's probably not true. I think it's, it sounds lovely. And don't we all wish we could do that? But if they were, you know, if you're really dedicated to the craft, you steal every second that you can get. And so that's how I write. Well, that's great advice. Well, I know that a, a lot of people write New Year's resolutions and they're promptly forgotten by the second or third <laughs> week of January. However, you consistently write a monthly <laughs> blog post updating the progress for your annual resolutions. Have you found that process motivating? Uh, or my lack of progress. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I do, though. Um Yes, I, I, and I'm very, you know, the, the most important part of that process is in December when I start crafting my resolutions. You know, a lot of people wait until January 1st. And <laughs> I say, if you don't put thought into like what your plan is for the next year, then that's probably why you don't care about it because you haven't really planned it out. So beginning on December 1st, it's on my calendar. It says start planning your resolutions. They're, they're resolutions, but really they're goals for the company. And, what is my company's goals? And if I spend a long time planning them and then I hold myself accountable every month by reviewing them and then posting them for public consumption. Um, yeah, it helps me a lot. And you know, the odd thing is I write a lot on my blog. You know, I, I write every day at least once and oftentimes more than once. And some of the most popular things I write are my new year's resolutions. Um, people really track what I'm doing and people <laughs> do the same thing now. And I, I can't tell you how many times someone will email me and tell me how inspired they are by both the progress I'm making and the fact that I'm failing. Like the fact that I may be failing a goal and they get to watch me fail the goal is almost as meaningful to just to know like, okay, that guy who's managing to get all that stuff done, he is also a failure and that makes them feel better. And I'm glad, you know, cause I set 25 goals every year about, and I've never met all 25 and I probably never will. You know, I live in a state of perpetual dissatisfaction, um, but I'd rather have more goals um, than too few. So yeah, people like it. I'm surprised. So, so instead, of, instead of working on their resolutions, they keep they spend their their year tracking yours. 
<laughs> I, I hope that's not the case. No, but, if no. them, but if it makes them happy, <laughs> that's fine. If it keeps them coming back to my blog and reading the rest of the things I have to say, I think that's great. That's great. <laughs> well, well, given your success to date with your novels, what advice would you have for someone who's listening, who's an aspiring writer and would like to one day have their own stories or novels published? You know, it's going to sound ridiculous. Um, but I hear it from everyone in the industry. You can't be a jerk. Um, my agent once told me, she said, I love what you write and you're very talented and we're going to publish many novels together. But she said, but the one thing you do that you can't stop doing is you're just not a jerk to people. And I've always been shocked. I, I talk to agents all the time. And I never thought this was the case, but agents will turn down work that they know they can make money on if the person who's written that material is difficult to work with. And for whatever reason, it seems as if there's a greater number of people who want to write novels who are difficult people. <laughs> that <laughs> the, the Venn diagram of difficult person and wants to write a novel, that middle section is very, very large. <laughs> and if, and there, you know, there's entitlement that people feel. And, um, you know, if you just start following some agents on Twitter, they, they sometimes report the insane interactions they have with people who want their novels published. So, you know, I make sure I know what my editor's coffee of preference is from Starbucks, and I know what my editor's assistant's coffee of preference is, and I know when their birthdays are, and I am patient with them, and when I'm hoping for a phone call and it doesn't come on the first day, I give them two more days before I follow up. Um, I just try to be as grateful and kind to everyone I deal with in the publishing industry as possible, and you know, which would surprise many of my friends because they would not describe me as grateful and kind. But when it comes <laughs> when it comes to my writing, though, I am because I just I know how fortunate I am. I know how many people would like to publish a book and I know how many talented people aren't getting noticed right now. So the fact that I've managed to come this far, I am incredibly grateful. And so I remember that all the time. And I, I just know from people in publishing that one of the greatest obstacles that people have is not their talent and not their inability to complete a book, but just their ability to interact with other human beings in a polite and generous way. So that's what I, that's my advice is always be nice to everyone, no matter don't be, what. Don't be a jerk. Yeah, really don't be a jerk. And it's ridiculous advice because if you're a jerk, you, you probably are stuck. <laughs> exactly. So, so what books or writers over the years have inspired you um, as you have pursued your career as a novelist? Um, you know, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's lots of people's answer, but Stephen King's book on writing, um, was huge for me. I remember when I was, um, working on something missing, I was at the gym listening to that book. I have it on audio and I have a physical copy of it. I love it so much. And I remember I was on the treadmill listening to the section where his kids are sick and, um, he needs some pink stuff, the medicine, and he doesn't have money for the pink stuff. And, um, I think they're living in a trailer and he's writing next to the washer dryer in a corner and he throws this, he throws the manuscript of Carrie in the trash and his wife rescues it. And, um, there's a section in the book when they sell the paperback rights for $70,000 and I'm listening to that section on the treadmill and I just, I got a little teary, um, thinking about the sacrifices that he made. And how um, how important his wife was to that process. And my wife is just as important to my process. But to hear someone in the position he's in describe how he truly felt, how hopeless and how um, in trouble he was. And to get to where he's been, that was great for me. I, I always, when I was stuck with the, something missing, I always thought of the pink stuff. I thought like, you know what? Um, Stephen King couldn't afford pink stuff and, you know. I'm in that same position now, but maybe something will happen for me too. So that book was, um, that book was very, um, inspirational to me. And then just reading great novels were, were was always great. Um, and reading novels, like the kinds of books that I write have been, has been very helpful too. And, and do you, do you find enough time to read? I do. Um, I listen as well. I mm -hmm. probably 
listen to about two thirds of the books um, that I'm consuming now, and I read about a third. So I can get through, if I'm right, I mean, I'm always writing, I shouldn't say that. I can probably, between listening and reading, um, I get through about five books a month um, in a good month, and I'm kind of happy. That's good for me. Uh, a lot of the stuff I read is galleys now. People will send me things that they um, hope I like so I can blurb. So I read a lot of that, too. But the audiobooks have been great. My, I have a set of wireless headphones that sit on top of my head at all times. Um, I, I forget they're up there, but when someone's not <laughs> talking to me, I press the button on my headphones and I'm listening to a book. So I'm, I'm always in a story some way. So where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels and your storytelling? Uh, just MatthewDix.com. That's my um, website. That it would take them to my blog and um, lots of other things. Great. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Well, again, we've been speaking with Matthew Dix, author of Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend and other novels as well. Matthew, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks. The stockings are hung and the shopping has begun. This holiday season, shop Cincinnati favorite gift cards at Kroger. Grab a gift card to La Rosa's and enjoy a warm slice of pizza. Or snag a gift card to Grater's and treat yourself to something sweet. Whoever you're shopping for, you'll earn four times fuel points on Cincinnati favorite gift cards. Head over to giftcards.kroger.com slash Cincinnati dash favorites to complete your shopping list and support our local businesses. Available in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Louisville markets only. Restrictions apply. See website for details.